From ancient times to the present, people claiming special powers have predicted similar events. Will their most frightful predictions of all soon come to pass? David McCallum is your guide to Ancient Prophecies 2. Countdown to Doomsday, next. The signs may surround us even now. Doomsday, Armageddon, visions of the end of time. Signs that prophesize the final chapter of future history. Those deciphering the secrets of the future, men like Malachi, Nostradamus, Casey, and before them the Greeks, the Hopi, the prophets of the Bible, the keepers of the Kabbalah, they all speak of a time that may soon come to pass the end of history, the final judgment. From the beginning, mankind has feared that the future spared no mercy for those who enter blindly. That's why the ancient Greeks, seeking protection from an unknown future, relied on a specialized class of seers called oracles, who were routinely sought for advice on love, politics, even the outcome of wars. One of these oracles was unique, because visions of the future came not from the living, but rather from the dead. Absolutely the most amazing and interesting oracle was the Oracle of the Dead at Ephora. Student of Greek oracles, Dr. Raymond Moody. This was an enormous underground institution that was in the far northwest corner of Greece. To the Greeks, the after-death realm was located underneath the earth, not as we imagine today like our hell. It was just that that's where you went when you were dead. Most people would go into an underworld environment. And that was why the early oracles of the dead were constructed as subterranean facilities. Those who sought to contact the dead descended from the world of light and life into a dark and foreboding cavern. Each downward step took the seeker closer toward a reunion with their past and a glimpse of their future. They were led through a vast and convoluted maze of hallways, twisting one way and winding another, ever deeper into the world of the dead. They would lead you down a corridor and put you in a room, a dormitory in effect, where you would wait until it came your time to consult the oracle. The wait was long and hard. It could last a month or more, and included sensory deprivation to prepare the seekers for a vision. Fed little, denied sound and sunlight, they found their minds wandering. Then without notice, the summons would come. When that time came, you were led out of your dormitory room into a 50-foot-long subterranean hallway. 
Stretching into the distance was the culmination of a long journey, a flickering path into the unknown. At the end were steps leading to a vast chamber where the searcher finally met the oracles, high priests of the afterlife, all gathered around a giant bronze cauldron, the gateway to the other side. They would highly polish this cauldron, which was made out of metal, fill it up with water, and that would make an optical clear depth. Indirect lighting from the flames of lamps would create really quite a spectacular appearance, and it was in that optical depth that people would actually seem to see their departed relatives and friends right in front of them, full color, three dimensions, moving, full size, and even talking. The dead relatives answered questions, great and small, allowing their descendants to know their destinies. The Greeks were a lot more focused than we are today on divining the future. And that's one of the reasons why the oracles were so important. When they went to the Oracle of the Dead, by and large, they were going to learn from the spirits of the dead some sort of information. After they had been in the central apparition hallway and had seen the images of their departed loved ones, they were then led out, and they were led into a room where they were fumigated with sulfur. In the ancient Greek culture, uh, it was regarded that if you had had any sort of contact with the dead, a dead body or with a spirit, you would have to cleanse yourself by immersing yourself in sulfur. Their bodies were cleansed, but nothing could erase the visions forever etched in their minds. From dust to dust. Not much survives of the splendor that was ancient Greece. A few decaying ruins. But the secret of the oracle, the secrets seemingly revealed in glistening reflections have endured throughout time. These reflections of the dead and the living never die. Ancient prophets sought protection from life's turbulent changes by invoking the supernatural in hopes of seeing and preparing for the future. Some accomplished this by gazing deeply into certain reflections, much as crystal ball gazers do today. One of the standard forms of divination in ancient Rome was what's called haruspicy. By gazing at the liver, they felt they could predict what was going to happen in the future. This probably originated with mirror gazing in the sense that when you expose a dead organism and bring it out of the body, it has a certain sheen on it. These ancient diviners would achieve their visions by gazing into the surface of the liver as though it were a mirror. Reflections also played a role in the lives of Native Americans who sought insight into a universal question, how long would one live? The Pawnee Indians had a ceremony in which they would take a badger, kill the badger, drain its blood into a bowl, and there in the moonlight, the children would come and gaze into the blood, which would of course act like a mirror, a reflective surface based upon the visions of themselves that they saw in the future, their parents would determine whether their life was to be a short one or a long one. In Africa as well, mirror rituals have long been woven into the fabric of tribal life. There was a tribal uh, practice in Africa among the Nakomis, an initiation ceremony. A young man is led to a ritual hut. Inside is a mirror positioned above a pile of human bones. The initiate gazes deeply into the reflection until an image appears in the mirror, the image of a dead tribe member. Afterwards, he must describe who he saw to the elders. If his vision was true, the man whose image appeared in the reflection was the very same ancestor whose bones lay beneath the mirror then the young man would be accepted into full rights and, uh, and responsibilities of manhood. In Central Africa, among the Basa tribe, reflections of the future may similarly be divined by a tribal shaman. Author Nuke Basom 
has experienced this firsthand. You see a movie unfolding. You see things that were, things that were, you see things as they are, and you see things as they would be. You come to the old man asking questions and seeking answers. I have an uncle who was a sorcerer. He always keeps a big basin of water under his bed. Maybe the young men have woman trouble. Could be, huh? So when you come, you say, okay, what do you want? He say, listen, I, uh, my mother is sick or my, my son is sick. I, what can I do to help him? He pull it out. He will put something in it immediately. You will see your own life or the life of the person you are inquiring about unfolding. Look there, young man. In there, where the dead live and the future hides. In America, over a hundred years ago, the future revealed itself to a president through two haunting reflections. Abraham Lincoln had a very striking mirror vision on the night of his first election in Springfield, Illinois in 1860. He was exhausted from the campaign and he collapsed onto a sofa. He looked up into a mirror that was mounted on the wall and he saw not one but two images of himself, one vibrantly alive, the other pale as a ghost. And his wife interpreted this to mean that he would be elected to a second term but would die in office. The 16th century man known as the King Amongst Prophets, Michel du Nostradamus, may also have captured reflections of future worlds. His astonishing legacy of prophecy includes what some believe to be predictions of Napoleon's bloody reign, the First and Second World Wars, Hitler's rise and fall, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the Challenger disaster, and a Third World War that will usher in Armageddon. Nostradamus may have discovered the end of time in a mirror. Author Dolores Cannon. Nostradamus had a very special room in his house that he used exclusively for his prophecies. No one else was allowed into that room. It was cold and damp, dark, made entirely of stone. And there on a large wooden table, he used various looking in devices. He had the best results with a quite remarkable special black mirror. He called this his doorway to the future. And as he stared into this mirror, he would watch the scenes of the future played out in all their horror before his eyes. And he would go out of this body and travel into this mirror, just like Alice in Wonderland going through the looking glass. If Aboriginal or ancient peoples were able to use reflections to visit the future, might that technique still work today? Could raising the dead through glimmering apparitions bring aid and comfort to those living now? One man found the answer in a mirror. Dr. Raymond Moody has studied the connection between human perception and prophetic vision. He knows that crystal balls are not a magician's prop, but rather the vehicle for exploring a hidden world. A high percentage of the normal population will, in fact, see visions of a certain kind when they gaze into an optical clear depth. It can be a crystal ball, can be a mirror, it can even simply be a lake or a pond or a body of clear water. Dr. Moody, assisted by his wife Cheryl, has devised a way to scientifically monitor these visions. Following the model of the Greek oracles, he created a special chamber that promotes psychic imaging, a psychomantium. I have a psychomantium that consists of a, a wall mirror mounted in a little room. The walls of the room are entirely covered with dark fabric to exclude light and reflections. The person sits in a comfortable chair just below the mirror so that looking up into the mirror, they do not see their own reflection. There's a light behind them which casts a diffuse illumination into this room. And when they look into the mirror, it seems that they are peering into an infinite depth. 
people have really extraordinary experiences. I think if I hadn't been here to see them myself, I would have a hard time believing some of them. A doctor of medicine at Harvard had so many faces and images coming at her from the mirror. She said it was like folks lining up at a phone booth to talk. She got frustrated by it and actually stood up and said, enough. One gentleman that was here, who was at the time a sports producer for TBS, saw his dog. Now, people laugh at this, but you cannot imagine how many people have asked us, do our pets survive the afterlife? Could I see my pet? In looking through the clear depth, he saw his dog, and I think it was one of the most moving experiences he had ever had. One incident showed the psychomantium to have unexpected powers. When I looked up, here was this spirit, looked like an angel to me with this baby. And she was so emphatic, she kept saying, the baby's okay, the baby's okay. When I went downstairs after leaving the booth, I discovered that the woman before me had gone into the booth. She had had a reunion with her baby who had died. And the spirit was telling this woman, your baby's okay, your son is fine. I continued her vision. By resurrecting the secrets of the ancient Greek oracles, a powerful new tool was added to the treatment of grief and mourning. But when others began experimenting with mirror gazing, the results proved ominous. Instead of viewing departed loved ones, the mirror gazers reported seeing an apocalyptic future world. When I first went into the psychomantium, I picked up a lot of emotional hurt and pain and sadness and what felt like to me a lot of people's stuff that had been left behind. I could see a scene coming up, and it looked like a portal looking down into planet Earth. However, there was no trees, there was no houses, there was no buildings, there was no nothing. What I continued to see was atomic explosion after atomic explosion after atomic explosion. As I kept watching that, I saw on the right at the top, two, oh, oh, oh. First, I wasn't sure what that was. I finally decided it had to be the year 2000. It stayed, and it stayed, and it stayed, and I saw many, many, many explosions. Darlene's horrifying vision of global nuclear war had one ray of hope, a space station with cocoon-like pods sheltering and protecting the survivors. I knew there were people inside, however, I couldn't see it. I could tell that the cocoons were breathing, that there was somebody alive in there, and I felt like they were all suspended in this inanimate state during the process of staying safe and protected and away from the planet when we needed to be away. I felt that I was one of the people in the cocoons and that there were lots of people in the cocoon, and the vision came to me as almost like a prediction or a feeling of what would happen. Darlene is just one of many to foresee impending disaster. One after another, those who enter the psychomantium have been bombarded by images of death and destruction. In the psychomantium, some of the earth changes that I have seen are just tremendous winds blowing things away that you can't imagine, even stronger than tornadoes and hurricanes, high waves, New York and coastline cities just breaking, the earth crumbling underneath from the water and, and the waves. These are all of the sort of the correlating signs that keep coming to me that say, yes, pay attention. My experience in the psychomantium was not what I expected it to be. I wanted to go to have an apparitional experience to help me move through the grief of someone that I lost. That is not what happened. I had an out-of-body experience. I went through the mirror rather than sitting and gazing into the mirror. And I found myself on the other side, and I saw the planet. I saw the Earth. Looking down from outer space, Joe Allen London saw details of mass suffering. In one vivid scene, the victims were children. It was a hospital-like setting. There were people there who were set up to work with whoever they brought in on the plane. It felt nuclear. That's what it looked like. There were masses of people everywhere. The children definitely were very much alone. Maybe they had just been separated from their parents. Maybe their parents sent them to get help so they could get what they needed, but they were alone. I saw one distinct spot in Florida, and 
It had a name. It's N-A-P-A or N-A-P-E. And I just saw it explode off the map. Soon after visiting the psychomantium, Joe Allen received chilling news from an old friend that supported her visions. She said that she felt like she needed to talk to me, and she didn't know why. So I asked her how she was, where she was living, and she said, I live near Naples. Her husband had gotten a job at a nuclear plant. I was sick. Inside, I was just sick. When Joy Thomas entered the psychomantium, she encountered images of a bizarre domed city. I think perhaps the only reason that I saw this dome city was to indicate that there was an energy source coming from underneath. Perhaps the earth changes, the, the violent earthquakes and the uprising of the land uncovered this source of energy. Joy also saw a space laboratory manned by scientists rushing to create desperately needed food. There were people in the laboratory wearing lab coats, and they had test tubes full of a clear liquid with plants starting to germinate inside. I asked for a year for that particular vision that I saw, and the year 2021 came to mind. Some apocalyptic visions are even closer at hand. Lydia Bao sees an earth of dark and deserted cities. I asked what had happened that caused this, and it was an asteroid. I could see it hit the Earth and cause a lot of destruction on the Earth. There was a lot of grayness, just gray and dark. I asked also for some places where it would be safe for people to live at that time, around 2011, and I got that it would be in Western Canada, Northern Colorado, Chile, and part of Egypt. Those places will be safe. That'll be where people are living. Now when people come out of the Oracle and they tell me that they can see the entire planet being destroyed in that way, I believe it and I also feel very frustrated. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. Although strangers to one another, they claim to have conjured fragments of a common vision inside the psychomantium. Pieces of a catastrophic event looming in the very near future. Yet this is really nothing new. For centuries, prophets and seers have warned the 20th century may end with chaos and devastation. Nostradamus may be the most famous of seers, but over the eons, hundreds of lesser prophets have charted the future. And what is somewhat foreboding, many of their prophecies seem to target, to point to the end of our millennium, the year 2000. John Hoag, author of the Millennium Book of Prophecy, has documented some eerie visions of our near future. There are many predictions that will be the countdown point for the final roller coaster ride out of the century into either thermal nuclear war, ecological disaster, or an apocalypse. One comes from an ancient monastery called Marienthal. The monastery was built in the 13th century. Since that time, they kept a guest book. One of its earliest loggings is from some unknown monk who wrote down the following prophecy concerning the coming events of the 20th century. And he writes, a war will come before which all previous wars will fade. Streams of fire will come from clouds where there are no clouds. Now, this strange riddle could mean that the fire is from greenhouse gases, invisible clouds. Then he goes on to say, in the middle of a great body of water, it could either be the Atlantic, but it could also be the Pacific. All capital cities on both sides of the water will be burned and buried under rubble and ashes. In this war, he describes these future Armageddon warriors as people who live like moles that are underneath the ground 300 feet. We know that our missile guidance systems are actually set 300 feet under the earth. 
He predicted this centuries before it happened. Many prophets seem to foretell the end of time with appallingly similar predictions. One warning of a looming apocalypse may herald from 17th century Scotland and the visions of a simple farm laborer. There are many ways that people can see in the future. The Brahant seer used a small piece of polished meteor, and he used to look into it and see images of his clients and foretell their future. He foresaw the coming of trains and pipe water and gas, and also the loosening of morals in the 20th century. He is noted for one prediction, which is either about a nuclear war or an ecological disaster. And in it, he says that deer and other wild animals shall be exterminated by a horrid black rain. We know that water mixed with nuclear fallout creates black rain, but water mixed with ash from volcanoes also creates black rain. So this could be a prophecy either of a nuclear war with nuclear winter following, or it is another of the many prophecies about a natural disaster befalling Northern Europe. He was noted for being a very blunt prophet, and it got him in trouble with the Countess of Seaforth, who had him tried as a warlock. As the crowd gathered around, she had him thrust into a burning barrel of tar laced with spikes. Bran Seer is not alone in the suffering he endured because of his prophetic gift. Many times it seems that the visions of future worlds are paid for with blood. In the 1930s, two peasant women named Maria and Elsa from northern Italy had a vision of the coming of a global holocaust. They said it came from Christ, and when the vision came to them, they both suffered stigmata wounds on their palms and their feet, bleeding wounds like Christ on the cross. And they saw cities devastated by the rising of the Earth's oceans red rains, which could be radioactive rains, and also a reddened sky, which might even be a description of the pollution in many of our city's skies. Unlike these simple peasant women, whose prophecies came unannounced, some people received these warnings of annihilation after much seeking. Pastor Bartholomeus Holzhauser was a 17th century preacher who was noted for his prophetic insights. He often prayed in seclusion, and his prophecies would come out of these experiences. He foresaw the coming of the French Revolution, which he said would take place around 1800 AD. He foresaw Hitler, called him a fierce ruler who would create great discord that would come from chaos, and from chaos he would return, devastate neighboring countries and conquer them. We know that Hitler came from the chaos of post-World War I Germany, and he certainly left the world in chaos when he died. He predicted the Cold War, as well as the coming of a Third World War or an ecological disaster. One of the aspects of that disaster is something he calls swords fashioned of a different kind that cut up the sky. To a man who lived when candles lit the night, doctors bled the sick, and horses powered industry, what specter of a technological future world could a 17th century pastor have possibly been shown? What Bartholomeus then warns is that there is a pestilence that comes to the earth from this activity. And he may have been foreseeing the ozone holes, of which he says, a great lament will come over all humanity, and only a small batch will survive the tempest and the horror. Is a higher power using men like Bartholomeus Holzhauser to show us a cataclysmic course of the future? Or can the source of these visions be something more sinister? Many people believe that prophecy is a gift from God, but also many people you would call insane have a similar gift of prophecy. Adolf Hitler, for instance, if you study his works, makes a number of chillingly accurate predictions that would put him right up there with Edgar Cayce and other prophets. But this man was a mass murderer. 
in the last 10,000 years 100 prophets that have proven themselves 75% accurate in predated predictions. They come from all corners of the world, all different times. You have biblical prophets, prophets like Nostradamus in the 16th century, prophets from America like Edgar Cayce, who have all these different various people that seem to share a collective vision. You can see that there are two clear courses in our future, in our near future. And one is doomsday, destruction of man. The other is breaks that pattern, that rut of misery that we call history. And we will maybe live as a race outside of history and therefore unpredictable. Prophets and soothsayers claim to divine the future by seeing into it. Their prophecies or warnings may arrive through dreams, visions, spirits, or even by the grace of a most beautiful young woman. Prophets are not the only ones entrusted with prophecy. Sometimes it's given to the less gifted, the man in the street. It may come to him as a sign, an apparition, or just a voice with wings. And often, it bears a warning. As we approach the end of the 20th century, there's been a staggering increase in the number of sightings of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Japan, Yugoslavia, the Soviet Union, Garabandal, Spain, and Fatima, Portugal, where several small children claim to have seen an apparition who left them a terrifying prophecy. Why has this apparition appeared so often? And is her message that the end is near? Journalist Michael Brown, author of The Final Hour, has carefully chronicled the visions of Mary phenomenon. The Blessed Virgin Mary has been appearing or manifesting since the first century AD. And there have been times when we see peaks in her appearances. Right now, we're going through the greatest peak that I'm aware of. Where she has appeared, uh, dramatic events seem to occur afterwards. One of the most amazing events in recent history occurred in Zaitun, Egypt, where the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to more than half a million people from 1968 to 1970 atop St. Mary's Coptic Orthodox Church. It began one night when a witness to the vision pointed at what he believed was a young woman about to commit suicide, Archdeacon Yusuf Kamel. He looked at the church, first he saw a ball of light. That light developed to be a young lady on top of the dome in the middle of the church. After a while, all passing by stopped to see the girl that's going to commit suicide from on top of the church. Suddenly, the Christian people cried, that is not a girl, that is the Virgin Mary. The girl on top of the church turned and faced them, and then floating over the middle dome, she came near the end, the, the front end of the church, and blessed them all. You had a tremendous circumstance because not just one or two or six or seven people were seeing the Virgin Mary, but hundreds of thousands, including former President Abdul Nasser, government officials, officials of the church, the Orthodox Church, as well as Catholics, Protestants, Pentecostalists. You had them gathering every night for several years. For the first time in human history, thousands of believers and non-believers all experienced the same inexplicable phenomenon. Dr. Kerry Malik was just one of the many witnesses. She stood there for a while, and then she began to walk on the roof till she reached the cross, and she knelt in front of the cross. She looked towards the area where I was, and she smiled. That view was the most majestic and beautiful and heavenly view I have ever laid my eyes on. I, I don't believe I saw her, or why she show herself for me. Why Saint Mary show herself for someone like me? 
a sheet of light just out of nowhere appeared on the top of the church. And my sister-in-law says, look, she's standing there. She came down, she stood on the ground beside the church. And then she moved into the church, and then she vanished. Many hundreds and then thousands, then tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people congregated there and for themselves saw a phenomenon and strange smoke and what looked like nearly luminous birds or doves. And this went on for several years to the point where, by some estimates, a million people saw the Virgin Mary in Zaytun or some type of supernatural phenomenon. The question is, why Zaytun? Why Egypt in the mid-1960s when the Middle East was a powder keg? War was in the air, a massacre had been plotted. The homes of Christians were marked for blood. Peace, it seems, would take a miracle. They marked every house of the Christians with a red cross, and then appeared the Virgin Mary. And instead of taking revenge of them, she cured them, healed them, gave them sight. The paralyzed began to walk. I heard a, a man uh, shouting, I see, I see. I was told the man was a blind Muslim and the Holy Mother gave him I back his eyesight. I can see. His eyes were opened and saw the figure of the Virgin in front of him on top of the church. The man was hysterical. He cried out. The miracle happened. The miracle happened. The miracle happened. I can see and begin stretching his hands, touching everyone around him. One girl named Teresa Galila had polio when she was about six months old. She could drag her legs with crutches, and she was healed at Saitun. And I had seen her walking. One of the most amazing miracles of healing occurred to a woman with breast cancer who came to Zaitun in search of a cure. One night, as she lay sleeping in a room near the Church of St. Mary's, she had a vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Father, I see the Virgin. She's standing by my bed. Now she's just by the window. Now she's gone. Before she go to sleep, deep sleep, she felt the virgin coming in with a small boy. The young boy gave her a small knife or something like that. And the virgin told her, I am going to remove the cancer from your breast. Oh, oh, oh it's painful. Oh, oh, I, oh, I can feel it. Oh. The next morning, the priest found a bowl of tissue next to her bed, and she was covered by a cloth with the sign of the cross written in blood. The amazing thing is, there is no sign of any wound or any opening or anything. X-rays, uh, analysis, proved that is free from cancer completely. The unexplainable, miraculous events of Zaitun, Egypt, are best understood by analyzing the testimony of the living witnesses, a study conducted by physicist Dr. John Jackson. All the uh, witnesses to the Zaitun event virtually uh, agreed amongst themselves as to what they saw. And so I think it's possible to construct what I would call a standard apparition uh, of what, was, what had occurred. The apparition was self-luminous. Most of the people would say they could see some features. Virtually everybody said the apparition would move in a natural manner and it looked very realistic. Some people would say the apparition was bigger than life uh, in terms of its size. What's interesting about it is that you had so many people who come from so many different parts of the, of the, of the world, really, coming together to agree that this is what generally people saw and more compelling evidence was found through analysis of the photos, which Dr. Jackson verified as authentic. The question is, 
are those real photographs. What you look for in uh, a scientific evaluation of these photographs are internal consistencies or inconsistencies. I spent a fair amount of time studying those photographs and I can't see any inconsistencies. So if that's true, then that would argue that the apparition was able to generate physical light that was able to go to a camera, uh, go through the optics, record itself on the photographic emul emulsion of the film as a photochemical reaction, and hence you have something physical associated with the, the apparitions. On the anniversary of the apparition at Zeitung, Pope Kirolos VI declared that this was indeed an authentic appearance of the Blessed Virgin Mary, whose silent message of love and hope had miraculously brought peace to the religious conflict within Egypt. Something very strange has happened here, perhaps something profound. You might be dealing with a phenomenon that lies out of heretofore classical science, and we have to be prepared for that. As the end of the millennium approaches, Apparitions of the Virgin Mary have proliferated in the United States. Along with her blessings come urgent warnings. In Phoenix, Arizona, a school administrator, a non-believer named Estella Ruiz, claims her life completely changed after Mary came to her in a dream. The first time that she appeared that I really saw her um, awake was on uh, December the 3rd of 1988. I was the only one that was awake in that dream, and I saw a light form like in the hall coming into our room. I knew in my heart that our Blessed Mother was going to appear. You're here. Our beautiful lady is here. Estella told no one about her dream. But oddly enough, about a week later, Estella's husband, Reyes, began to paint a likeness that had been known only to her. The painting after he finished it was the exact woman that I had seen in my dream. Exactly. The same white veil, the same blue mantle, the same white dress, and the same beautiful eyes. Several days later, as the Ruiz family gathered to say the rosary, the painting her husband had made of the Blessed Virgin Mary came to life. Estella finally knew she had been chosen. My God, the most beautiful woman in the world is here. At the very beginning, when she appeared, she said, we were not to tell anyone that she was appearing in this home, that she would bring as she wanted, and as she needed them, she would bring them. And that's exactly what happened. 200 people showed up that night without any public knowledge, nothing in the newspapers, anywhere. 200 people showed up. How that happened, I have no idea. Many healings and miracles were said to have taken place in the Ruiz home. Most incredible was the time Estella's rosary apparently turned to gold. She was looking at it, and the rosary was just turning gold uh, right in front of her. And somebody else was looking at it at the same time, so it, it, was, <laughs> it was quite an experience. I think that they're another manifestation, another, another little hint, another little sign that, yes, God is intervening, yes, something is going on here. Word traveled quickly about the appearance of the Blessed Virgin at the Ruiz home, and soon their backyard was filled with hundreds of people waiting for a message. Our Lady appears inside uh, to me. However, everybody outside can feel the presence of Our Lady, and that's been quoted to us many, many times by many people. And many people have told us they have seen her outside during the apparition. Along with miracles, blessings, and healings, Estella Ruiz claims the Virgin Mary speaks to her regularly, sometimes with prophetic warnings. At the beginning of each year, she will tell me more or less what will occur during that year. She told me that something severe was about to happen that would affect the United States. She had told us about catastrophes about to start. And it was that year that we had uh, very severe weather. We began to feel the, the earthquakes in California. And then the beginning of this year, she said that these catastrophes would accelerate. Your country is headed for destruction. This world is headed for destruction. The earth itself is telling us that there have to be changes in us. This is going on right now. 
We can't hide from anymore. We can't say, well, maybe, because God is really letting us know. Hey, I'm calling you. Are you going to listen or what? Seven school children in rural Africa were listening when they say visions of Mary appeared to them, throwing them all into profound states of ecstasy from which each would return with what they believed were terrifying messages. In the rural village of Kibeo, Africa, seven children from a Roman Catholic school would fall into a trance of ecstasy while speaking to the Virgin Mary. Their concentration was so intense that medical teams and psychiatrists performed tests to determine the authenticity of their rapture. When somebody goes into an ecstasy, it's nearly like they're being drawn into another dimension, uh, drawn out of our reality. Indeed, they'll tell you afterwards that everything disappeared around them. It was, maybe they'll see what seem like nearly clouds, but aren't really clouds, some other reality or dimension. And it's in that reality that they see the supernatural figures, whether it's the Virgin Mary, sometimes the Lord, various saints, different personages who are of a spiritual nature. And when they're in such a state, often, you can go up and you can flash a light in their eyes, you can pinch their cheeks, you can even put a needle into them, and they're not going to blink, they're not going to budge, because they are in, a, in an altered state of consciousness, a tremendously altered state of consciousness. But their eyes are open, and what they are seeing seems as real to them as anything that we see in a normal course of consciousness. But the seven children had a terrible message to deliver, a prophecy so horrifying that they wept as they revealed what they had seen. They were given a prophecy of the future, horrible pictures of, a, of coming turmoil and anarchy, blood. They were shown so many bodies, it seemed like there was no place to put them all. They were told that if mankind did not convert, that there would be apocalyptical events in the future. They were told by the Virgin Mary that that country would see a river of blood. That was a direct quote. Six years later, the prophecy was fulfilled with chilling accuracy in the nation of Rwanda, where Kibeho is located. This is the final times of the apocalypse because that's what it must seem like in Rwanda. So that was a prophecy that came true in, in rather specific ways and specific details. And she said at Rwanda that she had come not just for Rwanda, but for the entire world. And so if that's happening there now, one wonders what lies in all of our future. Long before the Bible, there existed a mysterious body of secrets that were handed down to a chosen few. They foretell the end of time. And these mystical teachings may decode the secrets of the universe. Collectively, they're called Kabbalah. Some scholars of Kabbalah believe that hidden within 72 ancient Hebrew names, a description of Armageddon may be found. Rabbi Philip Berg. A ball of fire will descend upon all of mankind. There will be periods whereby mankind will forget that the sun even appears. World War II will be so finite, so minuscule, as compared to the ultimate destruction that will take place within the next six years. This was stated 2,000 years ago. This chilling prophecy may be found within Kabbalah. Originally revealed to Abraham, the first of the Jews, Kabbalah is an ancient belief. So mysterious, so complex, it was long thought that people who delved into its inner secrets risked madness. Rabbi Ariel Bar Tzadok. These teachings then had to be very strictly safeguarded in very small, closed, secret societies until such a time when they could be revealed again not so much to defend and to protect the teachings, as much as to defend and to protect the people who would not be able to properly use them. 
These teachings armed Kabbalists with a forbidden knowledge so powerful that only a few could be trusted with its secrets, which included opening a window to the future. Throughout the ages, a number of prophecies trace back to Kabbalah. That which is referred to in the Christian tradition as the rapture does have its source in Judaism. It is said that in the end times, there will be 7,000 righteous found in the land of Israel. These 7,000, it is said, will rise up into the air and transform the bodies of light, like the body of Elijah. The renowned prophet Nostradamus studied with Kabbalists in Italy, and it's believed some of his predictions may have originated in the most important Kabbalistic text, the Zohar. The Zohar is a written record of an oral system that explained everything there was to know concerning the universe. And the Zohar provides all of the information, that which is present, that which is unseen, which is a vital factor in determining prophecy. The Zohar is a body of revelations which may unlock the encoded secrets of the Old Testament, otherwise known as the Torah. Included in these are prophecies of Armageddon, the war to end all wars. The end times are now. We're living in them. The enemies of Israel will attack Israel during the night with a major chemical and biological attack. And the numbers of casualties will be tremendous. And it is said that Israel will respond strategically with nuclear weapons, beginning of World War III. During the wars that are to come, multiple, multiple millions are to die. Here in the United States, you will see horrible things. Our prophecies do teach us that there will be a nuclear strike against an American city. Our prophecies teach us that America will not fall to an outside enemy, but will fall to racial rioting from within. Fundamental to Kabbalah is the goal of reaching spiritual perfection. But the world today is far from perfect and declining steadily as mankind plunges toward the millennium, the date when the cosmic clock may run out. All of the prophecies of Armageddon and gloom and doom that are written in the Bible by the prophets were not given by God because of our sins and he's gonna punish us because we're bad but rather they're the natural outcome and result. We as a race have not developed much spiritually, and therefore we are bringing upon ourselves our own fulfillments of our own destinies. Part of that destiny may include disastrous earth changes. There will be major changes upon the entire ecosystem, on the entire globe. Certain types of earth changes, hurricanes, volcanoes and earthquakes can be caused by the unleashing of certain yet unknown technologies. And I believe during World War III, these unknown technologies will be the cause of the majority of horrible storms. It is written in the Holy Zohar that there will be a time of darkness upon the earth for 15 days. How these 15 days of darkness and cold are to occur, it will be something from outer space, will it be something from an unknown technology, who knows? These are warnings the Kabbalists take seriously, based on earlier prophecies of destruction, prophecies which may have come true. Rabbi Ashlag, the founder of uh, the Kabbalah Learning Center in 1935, said that there is a black cloud that was spreading over Europe, predicted destruction that mankind had never experienced, all of mankind, not only the Jewish people, mind you. And obviously, he was referring to World War II. There are more precise and specific prophecies. Adolf Hitler's name was found to be spelled out clearly in the Torah. Next to what would spell the Hebrew number for six million, next to what would spell the Hebrew word for Germany. If predictions of death and devastation are to be found in the Zohar, can this knowledge be helpful? 
that man has control over his destiny is central to Kabbalah. In fact, some believe the Zohar predicts parallel futures of heaven and hell, the choice to be determined by man and man alone. Can, in fact, the doom and gloom that will take place in the year 2000, can that be prevented? Kabbalah says absolutely and unequivocally, yes. The biggest stumbling block that will prevent the peace on earth and goodwill towards men from ever taking place will be the lack of consciousness of the people to believe that what we consider to be miracles can become a very normal event in our daily lives. Believers feel that Kabbalah predicts a day when people will defy the shackles of their physical world. Breaking earthly bonds, man will fly, heal himself, see the future and prevent natural disasters with the same power Moses used to part the Red Sea. But Kabbalah says that future is conditional. If we don't get our act together by the year 2000, that if mankind does not take control of their actions, preventing the forces of evil from growing, expanding, then this ball of fire is what will be inevitable. A holocaust of a nature that the world had never seen is going to take place, destroying almost all of mankind, all vegetation, all forms of life. And only those who have studied and learned how to preserve their own physical bodies will live beyond Armageddon. Besides being able to foresee the future, the truly great prophets may often display psychic and healing abilities. As we come to the end of the 20th century, an American prophet named Paul Solomon may be considered one of history's most gifted seers. Edgar Cayce, one of America's most gifted prophets, passed away in 1946. But Casey's legacy would not end with his death. In the late 1930s, a child born to a Southern Baptist family would become known to the world as the second Edgar Casey. His name was Paul Solomon, and his warnings to the world would echo those of the sleeping prophet a generation before him. Thoughts of fear, thoughts of worry and disharmony will destroy mind, body, spirit science, technology, environment, the planet itself. Paul Solomon was a teacher, a healer, a priest in the true sense of connection with God, a miracle worker, a loving, caring man who believed that everybody could learn to develop their full potential. People started to talk of Paul as the second Edgar Cayce. And Paul's response to that was, hey, I don't want to be the second Edgar Casey. I want to be the first Paul Solomon. Born William Bilo Dove to a Baptist minister's family in the South, the boy who would grow up to be a prophet was a solitary child. He was said to have supernatural abilities that troubled his religious parents, as his wife Sharon recalls. When Paul was a child, he used to see lights around people. Afternoon, preacher, ma'am. Good afternoon to you, Mr. Harkins. <laughs> Paul, what do you say? Good afternoon, Mr. Harkins, sir. <laughs> he saw dark, dull, ugly lights as bad people. He's got a bad light. That's a bad person. Enough of this evil talk, young man. Show respect for your elders. Often, people who his parents thought were very nice and loving would then end up cruel or mean. They didn't know how to deal with that strange child. He learned very early not to say those kinds of things because um, it had such a, a reaction. It was very difficult for Paul as a child seeing and feeling these things. When young Paul saw beautiful white lights around people, he knew them to be genuinely good. One such person was his best childhood friend, Jada. Jada was a little black boy. 
And in the South in the early 1940s, white children didn't play with black children. Paul distinguished between the beautiful lights and the ugly lights, but he had no conscious recognition that there was a difference between black children and white children. A black child to him with beautiful lights was a beautiful child. And he made friends with this little boy, and the people in the town sort of frowned on their being together. But one day after a short illness, Jada suddenly died. Now alone, Paul left the funeral to mourn his best friend. Jada, you're back. They said you died. Yeah, I changed body. Come on, let's go play. And they played with each other. And the way Paul describes this, they played with each other as if he was a physical being. Over the next seven years, the spirit child Jada taught Paul many things, including an amazing psychic ability that would help him with his schoolwork. Paul was not very fond of studying. And uh, he was discussing this with his friend Jada one day. Jada told him yeah. that if he placed books Hello. on his stomach, he would be able to absorb the material. So Paul went through school learning by placing the books on his solar plexus, whereas all the other children had to study. One day when he was showing off, he read a note that one of his kids had written to another kid. Hold on, you think Steve is cute? Hey, Betsy wrote a note. She's goo goo eyes over Steve. Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. Paul must have x-ray eyes. Listen to this. Steve is the cutest boy in the whole wide world. <laughs> I'm telling! The little girl who had written the note became very upset and went and told the principal that Paul had somehow taken the note and communicated it. Hello? Yes, Principal Morn. He what? When the school principal phoned Paul's parents about the incident, they too became upset. Principal says you're scaring the other kids with your, your nonsense and... We don't understand what you're doing, but if it is not of God, then it's of the devil. And this scared Paul terribly, and he started shutting off his psychic gift. Convinced by his parents that his powers were of the devil, Paul reasoned that Jada too must be something evil. Stay out of my life. I don't want you to come back anymore. As a young man, Paul studied to be a Baptist minister in the honored traditions of his family. He had gotten his first church and planned to spend his life preaching in the Baptist faith. But his wife one day announced that she was leaving him. And there's no such thing as a divorced Baptist minister. So in an instant, his marriage and his life work ended. He rebelled. And he did everything that he could think of, from drinking to smoking to drugs to sex. That was what he thought God didn't want him to do. After five years, he realized that he was going nowhere. His life was going nowhere. He thought about going to a psychiatrist, and finally he went to a hypnosis clinic. But it was too expensive, and he became very, very depressed about it. So he went to his favorite little bar and sat down next to his friend, Harry, and he was telling him his sad story. I can't afford a therapist. I can't afford a hypnotist. Happy days, gentlemen. I can buy my buddy a drink. Let me try. I hypnotized somebody before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's good enough for me. Let's do it. Paul's adopted son, David, describes the results of Harry and Paul's experiment. As Paul recalls it, Harry did this boring hypnosis routine. And Paul lay there thinking, you know, this has got to be the world's worst hypnotist. You're getting sleepy, very sleepy. Keep your eye on the watch. You're getting sleepy, very sleepy. You're going under my spell. You're getting very sleepy. Your eyes are sleepy. The next thing he remembered, he woke up, clutching his solar plexus in pain. Why am I on the floor? Did you kick me in the stomach or something? No, no, I, 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 I put you under and, and you flopped down on the floor. 
some spirit started to talk, speaking right through you like, like you were possessed or something. It was, it was great. Get out of here. No. Oh. And he was angry and threw Harry out of the house because all he was feeling was pain. Harry came back the next day and said, Paul, I know that wasn't you because you're not that smart. What, what was being said there was much more intelligent than I know you are. And that intrigued Paul, so they tried it again. You're getting sleepy, very sleepy. This time, Paul remembered going through a long tunnel. And at the end of the tunnel, he saw Jada. He also saw a girl by the name of Merle, who he had dated in high school, who had also died. They were waiting for him at the end of the tunnel and they comforted him and they supported him and in effect held his hand as he explored this other realm of consciousness. They also asked a question about where his grandfather's money was because his grandfather had told Paul for years and years and years about this lost money. Paul, where did Grandpa hide the money? The money's in a chimney in a house where nobody lives. And they went to an old burned down house and they found the money and the stocks. The voice that spoke through Paul called itself the source. Very Author Dr. Wayne Wheeler describes the extent of its power. There seemed to be nothing in the entire manifold of universal creation which the source didn't know or that it couldn't find an answer to. Able, able to penetrate deeply into the total intelligence of the universe. It seemed to be a door opening onto infinity. I remember hearing a story uh, uh, that happened when Paul was first beginning to do readings, when he was in Atlanta, Georgia. Harry had told a policeman about what Paul did. A little girl had been lost for a few days, and the policeman came to Paul's house and asked if Paul could do a reading to help locate her. Now focus on our little girl. We see a street. Do you see a street sign? Yes. Magnolia. Do we turn left or right? Turn right. We see a house. We're inside the house now. This thing around the corner, we hear her now. She's hiding under the bed. Paul still doesn't understand how it worked. He just knew that he was able to see these things somehow because there was a need there. As word spread of Paul's miraculous powers, his reputation as a healer began to grow. He got so many requests for people doing readings, usually from people who were very desperate, who were in need of physical help. They had health ailments that doctors had not been able to heal or that they were emotionally distraught, people who were really at the end of their rope and needed support. In 1976, Paul did a reading for a man who had a son who, about a year old, was not able to keep down any food at all and was very emaciated, uh, had to be on intravenous feeding just in order to survive. Doctors had no idea what they could do to help this child absorb nutrition. The reading said that he had an allergy to cow's milk and that if they simply switched to goat's milk, he would be able to keep the milk down and start to absorb nutrition. They did it, and he's a healthy teenager today. There's a woman who had very severe scoliosis. Paul did a reading for her, and the reading suggested that she place a fresh ocean fish on her back and tape it to the back, keep it there overnight, and to sleep that way for a number of nights in a row. As the fish decayed, the enzymes would be absorbed into her bones, and her bones would become more supple. Not a very comfortable thing to do, uh, and certainly not a traditional healing technique, but it worked. With each reading, Paul became increasingly adept at contacting and communicating with this strange, all-knowing power. According to the people closest to him, strange phenomenon, even miracles, were an everyday occurrence. 
One day, Paul and another friend of mine and I were driving in a car, and there was an electrical storm going on, and Paul said that anywhere he pointed his finger, you'd see lightning. That's very funny, Paul. And I thought, yeah, 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 Paul, you don't need to pull this stuff with me. I saw a bolt of lightning right where he pointed it, and I stopped laughing, and I just shut up. I didn't understand how he did it, and he never explained what happened. But strange things like that just happened around him. Another eerie example of Paul's connection with the source was witnessed by Dr. Bill Beidler. Paul uh, came to my house uh, for a series of readings. I conducted them in my library. I had a double closet with a sliding door. Paul was laying on the floor in the dim light of the closet. About a third of the way into the reading, I saw uh, floating above Paul, his other body, connected by a cord to the solar plexus. Paul stopped right in the middle of a sentence. The minute I saw this, he stopped. And it took me a few moments to realize that I had interfered with the reading. So I, at that point, withdrew, and he took up right where he had left off without even a break. If, like Edgar Casey before him, Paul Solomon could see auras heal from afar and be associated with strange and miraculous events, would he also, like Casey, be able to describe events from the future? And would those snapshots of a world yet to come echo Casey's often dire prophecies of impending doom and destruction? The Solomon source has been remarkably accurate in its prophecies. The loss of the giant air base at Subic Bay in the Philippines is just one example among many. The source said that the United States would lose that base in 10 years, and in precisely 10 years, it was lost. The source predicted the end of the Iran-Iraq conflict at a time when most experts were telling us that it was about to increase. It predicted an early end to the 1991 Persian Gulf conflict. The source predicted the downturn of the Japanese economy years before it occurred. The source predicted the resignation of Richard Nixon well over a year before Nixon actually left office. The source predicted many things that have come true and were quite remarkably accurate. Paul Solomon began a reading by sitting up and praying. He then laid down, his breathing would nearly stop, and then his solar plexus would heave violently in the middle and it was like shooting a bullet out of his body, out of his solar plexus, actually. And you knew he was in trance. While deep in this trance, Paul's source would speak through him, revealing even more frightening information about the fate of mankind. Do we have any information on earthquakes? Considerable destruction in areas of the west coast of the United States. A quake measuring eight Point nine or higher in California is building and is close. And the beginning of the mass exodus from that greatest city there. Can you tell us about coming changes of the Earth? The continent America will split in half down its very center. A wall of water will come rushing across. He saw in a vision a tremendous tidal wave approaching the South Carolina and Georgia coastline that would inundate everything all the way until Atlanta and the Appalachian Mountains, and that this would occur during the time of the pole shift, around the year 2000. Changes in temperature make it nearly impossible for the survival of living species or plants. Not much be left recognizable on this ball of Earth. In the words of the source, this Earth is about to undergo a complete destruction, a, a relapse of cosmos into an amorphous state of, of chaos before this impending birth of, of a new Earth, a new world takes place. And specifically, the source mentions that it's th these last five years, they're of critical importance. Armageddon or future wars? The introduction of nuclear devices is building and is very close. You will see 
plumes of fire and smoke as spoke of in the book of Revelation. What we are talking about is a nuclear confrontation in the Middle East that will spread a great deal of radiation and toxic waste over a wide area. We see children dying in the streets and you will see destruction as has never occurred on this planet. Over and over again in the source readings it stated that we have a very short period of time in which we can change before the dire predictions given by the source come true. And if we don't change, they will come true. On the morning of March 6th, 1994, Paul passed away in his sleep, very peacefully. Paul had been very ill, and yet he didn't stop. He just ran all over the world helping people. He just didn't let his illness get in the way of doing the work that he needed to do. Paul Solomon tapped what he called the source to divine what may be looming cataclysmic upheavals. At the same time, in a far corner of the country, another source was being called upon by someone as innocent as innocent can be. A mother of three and another woman seeking peace and relaxation through meditation allegedly saw into the future. Why this happened to them remains a mystery. Sometimes it seems the most ghastly prophecies are imparted to those who are the most shy and unsuspecting. Her world seemed so ordinary and serene. She was a housewife and mother, quietly raising a family in the country. Then without warning, nightmares of a future world reportedly seized Laurie Toy. In 1983, I had three small children, all in diapers, and I was living on a farm. And I was awakened in the night, and at the foot of my bed stood an ascended master, the ascended master Saint Germain. And his aura was crackling, and it had almost a violet, luminous energy all around it. I had no idea what that meant, but then later on is when the dream started, a reoccurring dream which contained in it a very profound vision of prophecies of devastation. In the dream, four beings in white robes came and unrolled a map in front of me. There was a huge table where this map laid, and they always unrolled it almost as if it was this sacred object. And this map showed a United States that was drastically changed. I thought at the time, what a funny dream to have. I must be folding too many diapers or doing too much laundry. And I called a friend and said, I've had this very unusual dream. But, but that's just it. it. It didn't feel like a dream. I was there and saw the map. Years passed. The children grew, but Lori's dream never faded away. I didn't do anything for five years. Raised my kids, stayed on the farm. Then in 1988, I was encouraged by a friend who I told about this dream of the map to recall the details of the map. Uh, he had felt that perhaps there was information there that would be valuable to people. So we agreed to meet in the early morning hours. Using a meditative process, I could hear these beings in the four white robes speaking to me and telling me uh, the details of this map tremendous details of cataclysmic, destructive prophecies. When I first saw these four beings, I didn't know who they were. But later on, I became educated in these specific ascended beings. They would unroll a map, and there was always a master teacher who would come forward. And he always held a candle to light up an area, to almost show that I was to see something specific, to draw my attention to it. Intrigued by this information, Laurie Toy and her friend felt compelled to delve deeper. Coastline extending from West Houston, North Path, Dallas. Let me see what you have. We've got water extending from the Gulf up, I'm guessing, 50 to 100 miles, up past Houston here, north to Dallas. 
On their map, they had an indentation right about here, like an inlet of some kind. You want to go back and see if they have more? Sure. In the map room, they are with me. From Texarkana over to Mississippi, and down almost to New Orleans. Uh, what about uh, Nevada, Utah? Can we work on these? Yes, they say. They are showing me. It is all underwater, almost to Denver. Do you see any islands? Yes. Salt Lake City. I've noticed that after I come out of this meditative state, that a lot of times there's something altered within my own physiology. For instance, this morning, I blew out several lights just turning them on. You can always hear the tone on a, on a telephone. If I hit the, the dial on it, puts a whole other tone in there and I get the wrong number. We had over 80 sessions using this meditative process. What evolved out of that was the I'm American map which is a very highly detailed prophecy of Earth changes of the United States. The prophecies were so alarming that Laurie Toy began documenting each one so that people could be warned. They said the first thing that we would see would be a meteor that would be coming towards this planet and that that would hit somewhere in the Nevada desert. They said the next thing that would happen after that would be two to four years of rain. They said that that would cause an overall global warming. Also will suffer another devastating earthquake uh, in the Pacific Northwest, which will sink Oregon and Washington State. Wind and rain and extremely cold temperatures will pelt the East Coast and break up the East Coast into islands. The lower uh, tip of Florida would be flooded or sink. The Mississippi and the Missouri rivers would more than quadruple their present size. Many lakes and rivers would just burst. The Sierra Madres are what are left of California, Nevada, Utah, and uh, the northeastern portion of Arizona. Also, New York City, uh, covered by water. Even Philadelphia is shown to be underwater. It was a very extreme prophecy, very extreme prophecy. When we completed all of the maps, the master teacher known as Saint Germain ran his finger along the coastline of the map and he'd say five centimeters here, 10 centimeters here to correct any place where maybe we had penned it in wrong. I sold my house and uh, took the money from that to print the first time America map. We printed a thousand copies. I, of course, got my children to come in there and help mom roll maps. It was always our after school project because we had a lot of people that we had to warn. And we started giving maps away to hundreds of people and talking about what these prophecies were. But the Odyssey did not end there for Laurie Toy. The map captured the attention of a man who was also having visions of Earth changes, a man who became Laurie's second husband, a man named Len Toy, a prophet in his own right who shared the same startling visions. One day I said, well, you, you write down what you've seen and then I will go in into the meditative state and I will write down what I see. And we did that and we were amazed because both maps looked almost entirely alike. And there's great ice storms that form over the European continent and crash to the cities and bury them under 20 to 100 feet thick and as much as two to 300 miles long. All of these areas are then completely devastated. Because of the global warming that is so greatly affecting Western Europe, the European community joins together to detonate a nuclear explosion in the Mediterranean Ocean along a fault line to alleviate the water pressure that is rising and the area of North Africa into the Middle East is lost in this nuclear detonation. The European prophecies happen well, well after the prophecies that happen in the Americas. Seeing the future, knowing what lies ahead can be a blessing as well as a burden. Many people who call us, they always say, well, what do I do? Uh, a lot of people call in, in deep stress, in deep fear. They have children, they have homes, they want to have a future. 
Laurie and Len Toy are not the only ones who claim to be haunted with visions of global annihilation. Sue Spittler, during an innocent foray into the world of meditation, came face to face with what she believes was doomsday. She said the visions invaded like unwanted messengers. Home economist Sue Spittler. When I was doing the meditation on the universe, I really saw um, a great depopulation of the world and happening in very traumatic, fast ways such as earthquakes, large plane crashes, tornadoes, hurricanes, situations where, where large numbers of people would be eliminated. This is somewhat like a pruning, and I can sense uh, this pruning uh, to happen pretty steadily over the next maybe 200 years. I have a sense as the world depopulation occurs, that there are going to be other great physical changes in the Earth, too. I have a feeling that, that in the future, we're going to have much, much more water, much, much less land. And my sense of that is that we would have maybe one third, possibly as much as one half land mass compared to what we have now. I can sense that the Pacific Ocean might come in as far as uh, say Nevada. The Mississippi will be much bigger than it is now. I think any of the, the major rivers are going to be incredibly increased in size. Well, I meditated several other times on the subject of the universe, and the information that I received just kept building on top of the information that I sensed earlier. You finally have to come to a point that you say, it's true, it's real, it happens, I believe it. Fragments, glimpses of a dire future, appear to be flooding in from varied sources, from medieval monks to modern housewives. And like some nightmare puzzle, the pieces seem to be falling into place. Reportedly, Warnings of imminent global disaster are being received worldwide. And in the southwest United States, a stone, thousands of years old, bears a carving of what just might be a map of the future. Hidden in the desert is a secret, a secret linked to a prophecy of the ancient Hopi tribe of Native Americans, which warns, when the gourd of ashes drops, you will know the end of the world is near. The Hopi elders believed the atom bomb to be that very gourd of ashes, for in 1948 they held a tribunal, appointing a guardian of their prophecies. Prophecies set in stone by distant ancestors and covered with the dust of time. The man chosen? Thomas Banyanka. He's been here for a long time. They knew about destroying, but no one knew it was here. Thomas Banyanka is the keeper of the carvings. It was he who uncovered the prophecies etched in stone after they lay hidden for many years. So I wrapped this. So I was the one that cleaned this mess up and saw the drawing, and I was so surprised. Thomas Baniaka is one of several Hopi elders who is entrusted with the pre-Columbian prophecy that has a series of final warnings to be told to the world before what is called the great purification by fire. Either it can be a fire of nuclear war and greenhouse global warming, or it can be a fire of inner consciousness. In the Four Corners region of Arizona, the ancient Hopi prophecy rock looms, chronicling the destiny of mankind in Hopi hieroglyphics, leading towards what some fear is inevitable extinction. This figure represents the great spirit or guardian of this land that we came on this earth, what we call now the Mother Earth. In the first figure carved by the Hopi ancients, the great spirit or creator meets man. The creator then gave man the sacred circle, a promised life of peace and plenty if, and only if, man would follow the spiritual path. While the brown man waited, the white man traveled the earth on a mission to spread the spiritual circle and return with knowledge. He was supposed to bring this, but instead he brought a 
symbol of a cross, they said. It's on here, cross. Breaking away from the Native American people, the white man now traveled the path of materialism and invention, as shown by these three figures on the Rock of Prophecy. I always say that first figure represents first uh, invention like wagon pulled by animals. And later the second one representing advancements and in, in, uh, inventions, he brought auto automobiles that run by itself. Then the third one represents also advancements in, in inventions, scientific things, and now they have rode up in the sky. With the invention of the aeroplane, the white man now commanded the land, sea, and sky. And just as the Hopi prophecy rock appears to predict, this thirst for power led to two devastating events, World War I and World War II. There's a line down over here, and that's where we are today. And the zigzag line represents up there big nations. Powerful nations put the military might together and kill thousands of women, children, animals, birds. We have, we have now come into last little circle above the line, which is, the, they said, maybe the beginning of Third World War. And so, as the Hopi prophecy goes, we find ourselves at the crossroads with the fate of the entire race of man hanging on one all-important question. Do we return to the sacred circle and a life of harmony and abundance? Or do we take the jagged road, leading us further and further from the spiritual path? If that happens, according to Hopi prophecy, the purification by fire will immediately commence. These chilling words place us precariously close to the edge. Will civilization end in a holocaust of flame? They're not going to save the world. They're not going to bring peace and justice. They're going to destroy the world. That's what old people say. So it'll just end with gold full of ashes. The whole world, all living things will be destroyed. There'll be nothing left on this earth. Everything will burn up. Logic, reason, just plain common sense, all argue that seeing into the future is impossible. Science tells us that prophecy is no more than superstition, or at best a parlor trick. But what if there were evidence to the contrary? After all, not so long ago, man was made to believe that the Earth was flat. The Hopi carved it into a stone. Kabbalah has the message in code. And for thousands of years, prophets and seers have foretold of a time our time, the end of the second millennium, when life as we know it might come to an end. But one needn't look to the prophets of old to uncover warnings for the future. Omens of doomsday may surround us now, invading our dreams, leaving clues, triggering visions of devastation, giving us a sense of foreboding that something is terribly wrong. Hope springs eternal. The present need not be victim to what is to come. The test of prophecy may not be to predict the future, but rather to change it. And the power to change still rests in our own hands. Doesn't it? <laughs>